just started my series. This one is called Everything We Do for the Glory of God, and I'm teaching us about God's glory. And we found out that there's a lot of things we don't know about God's glory. We, we kind of got it confused with his essence and his character of, of who he is and his attributes, but really his glory is, is set apart far from any attribute that he has. It's the totality of who he is and to teach you how to glorify God and to understand this is the reason why we exist. It was a, just a profound thing for me and it was the last of the series where we do everything that we do, we're doing it for God. And, and this kind of brings it to a closure of understanding why God has equipped us, why God saved us, why God gives us gifts, why God gives us the Holy Spirit. Why do we have authority to cast out demons? Why do we have authority to share the gospel of Jesus Christ? What is our mission? How is our purpose formed from his glory? Everything that we do, everything that he has gifted in order is for his glory only. And sometimes us men and women, we get puffed up and, and God has to smack us right in the place. That is not about you. It's kind of like in our walk in Christianity. We always size to make it about us. Somehow, some way, we want it to come back to us. But it's never going to be about you. God's going to equip you, fill you, save you, direct you, guide you preserve you, appoint you, anoint you, commission you for him. Oh, you thought it was you. You, you thought it so you could be a superstar in heaven and get the big mansion while they get the little mansion. If I could just be a gatekeeper in heaven, that's the humility. God says, you humble yourself, I will exalt you. He that is last will be first, and he that is greatest will be the least. So how do you get there? You make sure you never lose sight of what's important, him. I just want to just start with this one scripture, uh, Romans eleven thirty six. 36. The Amplified. I'm only going to recap this scripture. For from him all things originated. We we're talking about the glory of God. We we're talking about God's glory, and I'm going to teach you that today. He says, for from him, all things originate. Everybody say all things. All things. Does that mean some things? No. A few things? No. That's everything, all, totality. There is nothing from in heaven and earth, from the bugs to the ground, to the birds and the bees. All things originated. And through him, all things live to exist. Everybody say all things. That means everything. That means everything lives and exists, okay, through him, not through any other way. And then it says this, and then to him are all things, everybody say all things, directed so that it doesn't matter where the wind blows it doesn't matter where you go in your life it doesn't matter if you go to jail if you are poor or born in, 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 in a poverty condition you are still going to be direct it doesn't matter if you walk away from God it doesn't matter if you don't believe in God you are still going to be directed to him and let me give you a conclusion of those that don't want God it's called judgment you will still be directed to him. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You see how God, the creator, in his glory, not only that he's created all things, that not only does all things exist through him, but nobody can take what's his. It all ends up coming back to him. And to him be the glory and the honor forever. This is still part of the recap. That the ultimate goal of the universe, and we established what the universe was, and it was powerful. I'm not going to do that science teaching again. But we describe the universe as being everything that is. And uh, we went through the galaxies, and there's 100 billion galaxies. And then we broke down how many stars are in a galaxy. There's hundreds of billions of stars in the galaxy. And then God just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And we took him out of our little box, and we opened him up because we want to see how big his glory is. And so, and then we went on to say that everything and the goal of the universe is to show the glory of God. And we broke down what that means. And it is the reason for everything that exists, 
including you and I. God made it all for his glory. God says in Isaiah 42 and 8, I am the Lord that is my name, and I will not give my glory nor share my praise with craved idols. God is so big, so powerful, that he created all things. And all things originated from him. And all things are directed to him. And all things exist through him. And he will not allow anything of this world or the world to come to take, to sap, to tamper with his glory. And when we give ourselves to another deity, when we give ourselves to something that is not of God, we are taking his glory from him. Without God's glory, there would be nothing. So now I get to explain to you what is God's glory. But before I do that, I just want to say this. We talked about the significance of our life compared to God's glory. Have you ever wondered why the Bible tells us that we are just a vapor? We're just a mist? I love this one version. We're just steam from a teapot. Sweet. Did you turn it off? And it's gone. Can you measure a puff? That's life. It's over. And then he goes on and says, it says, man, in Psalms 144 and 4, he says, man is like a mere breath. His days are like a passing shadow. Reason why I want you to understand this is I want you to know without a doubt, wherever you are in your walk with God, whatever you think, that your life is not guaranteed to be long. That your life in God's perspective is just something very small. Yeah, you won't live longer than a star. Yeah, you won't live longer than a moon. Yeah, you won't live longer than a tree. But yet, you are so important to God. You're more important than a star. You're more important than a tree. That should make you realize that your life that is so short that it doesn't belong to you that there is something you're supposed to be doing with it. And this is why you're in church. This is what you're trying to find out. Make sense of my life, God. God is no respected person. Doesn't matter if you're cute or ugly, fat or skinny, intelligent or dumb. Matter of fact, he prefers you dumb. He don't like smart people. He says he uses the dumb things of the world to confound those brainiacs. God likes you humble. And in all that, I want you to remember, as we begin to explore the glory of God, understand this, that your life is so important to God for the short amount of time that you have that you must make it count. You got to make it count. You should want to make it count because you were created in his image to give him glory. And when you think about what a privilege that is, you will change the way you look at your salvation. You will have honor and courage in it. You will be like Jesus. I must, I got to be about my father's business. It will burn in you to become something in God. Not for to be seen by people, but in his eyes only. What is the glory of God? It is who God is is it is the essence of his nature his essence means it's his soul it's his spirit it's his quintessence you know what that word quintessence mean i love this word it means the most perfect example of quality oh yeah put that in your dictionary quintessence that means the glory of God is who God is, and it is his essence. That means it is his soul, it is his spirit, it is the most perfect example of quality. You can't find a more greater example of quality than Father God. And then it goes on to say this, it is the essence of his nature. What is his nature? The nature is his character, his moral qualities. Listen to this. This is how one man summed it up. He said, it is who God is. It is the essence of his nature. The weight. Now think about this. The weight of his importance. You know what that means? God is important. And it can't be measured how important he really is. 
It says this, that it is the radiance of his splendor. I'm explaining to you what God's glory is. That means his splendor. That means his brightness. His radiance means his illumination. That means when God comes on the scene, it is overwhelming light. I told you I read Revelation 20 where it says that there will be no need for no stars or moons or sun because the radiance splendor of God will light up all of heaven. So say goodbye to the moon and the sun. It is the demonstration of his power. You see how all these are just one characteristic of his glory? It's not the totality. See, there's no singular description to describe God's glory. So when you see God's kindness, that's just an essence of his character. When you see his power, practice, that's just an essence of his character. When you see him feed you or make a way out of nowhere, that's just another essence of his quality. See, God, people get God's glory mixed up with one attribute of him. But in his glory is the totality of all the things he is. Oh, yeah, I, I could tell by the looks I'm getting. He's bigger than you're thinking right now. He's so big, you can't even imagine it. You can't even conceive it because he's incomprehensible. Just try. Just, just look. If he's this big, just try to get this much. That much will fuel the rest of your life, all the days of your life. Just, just that much. How much faith did Jesus say we need? And a mustard seed is the smallest seed known. But has anybody ever seen a mustard tree? Grows over 150 feet tall. One of the biggest trees in the world. It is the atmosphere of his presence. Now I need you to think about this one. I'm describing the glory of God and I know it's big, but I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to think about the atmosphere. The atmosphere at your job, the atmosphere in the universe, the atmosphere in the skies above, the atmosphere everywhere we go. God is in the atmosphere of his presence. You find him in everything. That's why he's omnipresent. That's why he's omnipotent. Yes, when you're on a tour, Ben, He's in the atmosphere. Tommy, when you're traveling in an airplane and going to present your programs, he's in the atmosphere. When you look through that window and you see the clouds and you see the mountains, he's there. When you go outside and you look up to the sky or you see a tree or you see a butterfly or a bird, he's in the atmosphere. Kids, when you're going to school and you're on the bus, when you get out and you breathe that air, he's in the atmosphere. (laughs) it is who he is father I thank you that your glory is far beyond our understanding that your glory is bigger than our imagination that your glory is who you are it is the essence of everything that you speak that you say it is your splendor it is your power it is your presence It is the weight of who you are, your importance. It it is your radiance. It is your demonstration to be all that you are. And it is your atmosphere. It is that which surrounds this earth. God's glory is the expression of his goodness. Just, just, Just let that sit on you. God's glory is the expression of his goodness in all his other intrinsic eternal qualities what that word means intrinsic is his essential that means it is absolutely necessary for God to show you his qualities it is absolutely necessary for God to express to you and declare to you and proclaim to you and announce to you who he is. 
It is his eccentric, quaternal qualities, which is essential to who he is. If he did not have those, you would not be here. If he did not have those, we wouldn't have a life. He would not created you. There wouldn't be a star and a moon. There wouldn't be a galaxy. There wouldn't be a universe. There wouldn't be you. He has to be all that is all to everyone, whatever your situation is. And that's his eccentric character that allows him to be absolutely necessary for what you need in your life at this particular time. If it's healing, he gives you healing. If it's deliverance, he gives you deliverance. If it's faith, he gives you faith. If it's wisdom, he gives you wisdom. If it's knowledge, he gives you knowledge. If it's a blessing, if it's a job, that's God working on your behalf so that you will do what? glorify him are you starting to get this this is bigger than any sermon i have ever preached and i've preached some of the doozies so the next question is where is the glory of god it's everywhere just look around the glory of god is in these chairs right now everybody look at everybody yeah you're looking at the glory of God. Oh, you thought she was just your wife? Shame on you newlyweds, both of you. Everything created by God reflects his glory in some way. From the, oh, I love this part. From the smallest microscopic forms of life. Now stop there. JL, I'm going to use you as an example. When she goes on camping trips with her dad, she seems to find the most smallest microscopic forms of life critters creatures and i know that jl's very inquisitive she ain't scared of nothing she pick it up let it go you know and then her dad's doing a video look at look at my baby girl she's gonna be a biologist she's not afraid of anything but what i like about that is that moment jl is learning about god's glory she may not have known it to the day but now she knows it, that God has detail in everything. Now, we all hate the fly. Well, Biz a cook like me, we, we taught the fly carries five million forms of bacteria. He cannot be nobody's friend but God's. So from the smallest microscopic form of life to everything that you say, oh, ah, ugh, why that? Creatures that's in the deep of the sea, new species of bugs. Let me tell you something right now. <laughs> Why do you think we keep finding new species of stuff? That ain't the bugs that Adam named. Since Adam, we didn't got a million more creatures. Because God never sleeps nor slumber. Amen. Imagine what he's doing. Do you, you know how he'll just slip it in and, and science goes, well, well, we got a new Look, we got a new mosquito just keep growing, huh? There's, since I've been alive, there's been like seven new mosquitoes that come out. God is always creating, creating, because as we get done in describing this, so from all the microscopic form to the vast Milky Way, can you just wrap your head about a, a, a hundred billion galaxies in the universe? From the vast Milky Way to the sunset of the star. You ever notice how the sun goes exactly and does exactly what it's supposed to do? And the moon does exactly what it's supposed to do? And it's been doing this since the beginning of time, right? But through the Big Bang, we say 13.8 billion years ago. I want you to think about how awesome and big God is. And, and as I keep going, okay, and then makes the, the storms to the season. We, we get winter, spring, summer, and fall. For all you snow people, you go live there. For you desert rats, we stay here. For you northerners that want rain and gloomy clouds, you can go there. But you get all these seasons, and then storms come. The wind the waves of the ocean. What makes the ocean make waves? Forever. And ever. They're like the moon and the stars. You are going to wave all the days of your life. It don't matter what ocean you're at. 
the Pacific, the Atlantic, the Red Sea, the Black Sea, the Caspian Sea, waves. Who is making those waves? I got to figure this out. <laughs> it's some type of gravitational pull that allows the water and pressure to build up that it causes the hippopotamus motion. But that's what I would say if I was a scientist. I would make it sound like I knew what I was talking about. But we don't know. We can't explain it. We can't even explain why a star falls. Oh, well, I'll tell you why it falls. Uh, well, it burns out. Yeah. In the book of Enoch, which you've never read because you have to go and get it. Enoch was the guy that pleased God. And he was like the first priest in the days of Adam and Eve. He lived 900 something years. Well, he actually was 230 and he was gone. But everybody used to come to him and he was the first godly man. It says in the Bible in Genesis that Enoch was a man that pleased God in all his ways and then he was no more. Well, don't you want to know what happened to Enoch? Enoch has three books in the Hebrew. I don't preach them in the church because it will blow your mind away because Enoch became an angel. But the thing is that Enoch said when the angel took him to heaven multiple times, he said that when God created the sun and the stars and the moons, he gave them a command to shine. He commands them to shine. I know we're talking about the glory of God, but you got you to get this in your head. Forever and eternal is a command for the ocean to make waves, for the wind to blow, for the stars to shine. For the moon to come out when the sun goes down. For the sun to rise. For the moon to set. For man to be born. For birds to regenerate. This is all the glory of God. You just never looked at it as this way. This is God's eternal quality of working himself throughout all of the universe. Over and over and over again. So here's my theory why a star falls. That star was disobedient. It says this in the book of Enoch. That God has containers. Now, you got to understand, this is Enoch trying to describe. And back in those days, it wasn't like our container we get at the shipping yard, guys. No, no, not the ones in China that they come on the boat. But in other words, Enoch was saying they're corralled. And when they don't shine, God puts them in time out, so to speak. And guess what? He makes another sun go shine. He makes another moon shine. Now, I know you're like, huh? That's what I'm saying. This is how big God is. If you think about it, have you ever seen the sun not shine? Has it ever been recorded in any lifetime of human being that the sun did not rise? That the moon did not set. That there was not stars in the sky. Well, how do you think those things happen? They're commanded. God is so powerful that he says, let everything in this universe glorify me. And he commands it to be so. You believe that with all your heart. You believe that with all your mind. And you believe that with all your soul, that that's how big our God is. Listen, for you to glorify God in everything you do after we get done with this series, you will understand why. And you will gravitate to the honor that of everything God made, he made us special. Don't get big headed like I did. I got excited. The creation reveals the creator's glory. Creation. We sing that song, hill song. Creation reveals the creator's glory. Think about that. Creation. Are you guys a part of creation? Some of you think you ain't. Yeah, you are. Creation reveals the creator's glory. In nature, we learn this. God is powerful. And that he enjoys variety. God just blows my mind. Do you know that there's not one of us? Right now we got 7.8 billion people alive right now in the world. And then how many times has that turned over? We can't even count that high, okay? So just imagine all the 7.8 billion times 5, 10, 20,000 years. 
We got Old Testament go back up to 6,000 years. We, we, we still ain't figured out when Adam was born, right? We trying. We, we, we getting close. So maybe one day. Well, anyway, start times and all that, right? That's a lot of people, right? Do you know none of us are the same? Now, I want you to think about this, okay? Every single person that ever existed has a different fingerprint. Everybody look at your fingerprint. Look, man has even taken advantage of it. Fingerprint ID, unlock my phone. Fingerprint ID, get into a building. I sit here and I lose my mind trying to figure out God. I'm just on the outside of the body. I need some help with the medical field to go inside the body. What is different that every human has that gives them an identification of who they are on the inside of their body? Wait, we all, we got the same DNA, right? Exactly. So from the outside to the inside, God identifies each and every one of us. And he's so glorious. He says, in your mother's womb, I formed you. And then he goes in and he says, and as you were in this womb, I am prescribing your character. I'm prescribing what you will look like. I'm giving you your gifts inside your womb. God is so powerful and he joins a variety. He loves beauty. Everything he creates is beautiful. I know we see some of the most ugliest things in a book and science from mammals to reptiles to insect and you're like, Gah. but when God was creating you, he didn't say you was ugly. So don't you say something that he created is ugly because that thing that he created that you said is, ugly, is looking at you and saying you uglier than me. Yeah, think about a snake and a bird. They look at you, <laughs> they can't fly, they ain't got no talents or nothing. Let me go bite them, Psh, die. But imagine, I hate spiders. And I, I still can't get into seeing beauty in them. A tarantula so hairy is gross. And even though, this one don't bite. Oh, yes, he does. They all bite. This one's not poisonous, but they'll leave a big old blister on you. And then you got the black widows. And what's that little brown skinny spider that kills people? The brown recluse? Why, God? Some of the most poisonous snakes in the world are only this big. And yet when God created this thing, he saw beauty in it. He gave us a variety. Imagine if every animal was the same. Imagine if every human was the same. Imagine if every insect was the same. This is what God's glory is. He enjoys variety. He loves beauty. And then he's organized. Have you ever imagined God not being time managed? Come on, you corporate people. We have to have time management skills, right? You housewives, multitaskers, business owners, multitask, organized, right? So imagine what kind of skills God has to create the universe. Imagine if we could just get a bit of his. Man, every corporation would hire us. He's wise and he's creative. David tells us this in Psalms 19. He says, the heavens proclaim the glory of God and the skies displays his craftsmanship. Stand up. Throughout history, God has revealed his glory to his people. And there's some stories that I was going to read to you guys, but this is just the way the Holy Spirit went. But I'll just paraphrase him. The first time he revealed his glory to a person was Adam and Eve in the garden. In Genesis 3 and 8, it was after they had ate the apple. And they were, it says that God was walking in the cool of the day. And he called out to Adam and Adam was hiding with Eve, and he says, I've been calling you, where you been? He goes, oh, I wouldn't hear because I heard the sound coming through the garden. He says, and I was afraid because I was naked, and God said, who told you you were naked? But that is the first known time that God had ever revealed his glory. And then my favorite book, my favorite exchange with Moses in Exodus 33 from 18 to 24 was when Moses said, God, I want to see you. And so God told Moses, okay, tomorrow I will show you my glory. Moses went to Mount Sinai at least nine times. Sometimes he was gone for 40 
three days. Sometimes he was gone for three days. But each time that Moses went to Mount Sinai, it says that God's glory and his presence was there. And Moses was so used to God's glory after everything turned white on him and he seemed to age but still looked young that God began to talk to Moses. And Moses said, okay, God, I just don't want to see your burning bush. I just don't want to hear your voice. I want to see you. I wouldn't need all that that Moses needed. I just need a poquito. But Moses wanted a whole lot to turn around and be prideful at the end of his walk. Goes back to Isaiah 42 where God says, I am the Lord that is my name and I will not give my glory to anyone. You see, for Moses to have tangible experience with God's glory for Moses to be hidden behind a rock and God says I won't let you see my face because if you see my face you will surely die he says but I will pass by and I will declare my name Yahweh as I walk past you and I will call out my name and I will take my hand and I will shield you and as I walk past you you can see the back of myself because his glory his splendor is so bright and so illuminating that no flesh can stand in the presence of God. Listen, this right here is a faith thing. It's all a faith thing. I tell these stories with so much enthusiasm, with so much excitement and animation and charisma. You know why? <laughs> because I believe it with all my heart, all my soul, and my spirit confirms it. See, if you've never had an encounter with God, I pray that one day you will, so you'll know outside of everything you've ever experienced, from the highest high to the greatest pleasure to the happiest joy, an encounter with God supersedes that by 100 billion. Just one, just one, just one experience with God where you see the living, omnipotent, omnipresent God swoop down from heaven. I just explained to you all his jobs he has, but yet he go to you, Ben, in the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of your trouble, and he delivers you. Can nobody tell you God ain't real? He saved my life more than I can count. We all have a testimony. And guess what that testimony is for? For the glory of God. So in the weeks to come, we're going to learn about this. We're going to learn how do we glorify God. Some of the ways we do it is by our faith, how we believe. Our faith glorifies God. It makes him feel worthy. It makes him feel pleasure. It makes him feel joy and happiness and honor that you believe in him. What did Jesus say without faith? It's impossible to believe God. I don't know where you're at in your journey. I don't know where you've come from. I don't know where you are spiritually. Even those that have been with me for six years, I have no idea where you're at spiritually. That is intimate. That is between you and God. But what I want to tell you, ask God to give you faith, to believe in his word. We're only preaching his word, people. And sometimes that's the hardest thing to believe. But I promise you, if you would allow your faith to grow and say, God, give me the gift of faith, increase my faith. Do you know as a pastor, I pray every day, God, increase my faith. Sometimes it doesn't matter how many times I've laid hands and how many miracles God has worked, how many times I've felt his name. I still want to keep believing in the impossible. I want to believe in the things that's inconceivable. I want the comprehension of that that is incomprehensible. And it comes by faith. When we get done with these things, I just want to always remember to glorify my Father in everything I do. I want to love God so much. I want to be thankful for all that he's done for me. 
when we get to look at a snapshot of this, those that are standing here right now, you should be thankful. You kids should be thankful. You know how many kids your age are dead? Millions of them. Just because you're a kid doesn't mean you can't glorify God. I want you to never, ever look at God as something small again. I want you to open up your eyes, those spiritual eyes, to see how big God really is. There's nothing God can't do. We just sat here for 45 minutes explaining how big and powerful he is, how precise, intricate, and organized and loving he is. Father, I just thank you that we have no idea, God, how wonderful, how marvelous, how indescribable with human words we we run out of ways to put you in our mind. Father, if you could just open us up just a, a tiny bit to increase our wisdom and our knowledge, but most of all, Father, our understanding of your glory. <laughs> that is bigger than your power. It's bigger than your love. It's bigger than your kindness. It's bigger than your concern and caring. It's, it's bigger than your creativity. It's, it's bigger than your existence of, of all the things that you have brought into fruition. It's, it's bigger, Father, because it is you. It is the totality of all that you are. It's beyond our understanding how you could be everything and everywhere and hear everything and understand everything and make everything and be involved with everything and how do you do it God how are you so big how do you know everything you say you know my heart better than I know myself you know the intentions of my heart you know the thoughts of my mind when I look upon something or when I think of something evil you know that thought and I try to hide those filthy rags how could I ever think that you are not aware of everything I think? Oh, God, we don't do a good job of glorifying you. Teach us. Holy Spirit, teach us. Teach us in the next few weeks how we can glorify you. I don't ever want to take you for granted, God, to just assume that life is given to me for no particular reason, to think that I'm entitled, that you owe me something because you created me. Oh God, correct us in our foolishness of giving other things in our life more glory than you. Humble us, Father. You said that if we humble ourselves, you will raise us up and exalt us high. I thank you, Father that your word is penetrating, that your word is consuming, that your word is devouring our own emotions even now. Holy Spirit, make God big in our lives. Let us see him in such a profound way that it's an honor to bring him glory. In Jesus' name, amen.